السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله السلام عليك يا ابن رسول الله فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحصي نعماه العادون ولا يؤدي حقه المشتهدون الذي بعد فلا يرى وقرب فشهد النجوى تبارك وتعالى والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء وخاتم المرسلين والشفيع المظنبين سيدنا ونبينا بالقاسم محمد ولا أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الذين أظهب الله عنهم الرجس وطحرهم تطحيرا اللهم صل على محمد والآن تدامة الباقي لعدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم وغاصب حقوقهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم ولو أنهم الظلم أنفسهم جاءوك فاستغفروا الله واستغفر لهم الرسول لوجد الله طوابا رحيما صلوات الله عليه وسلم Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one of the ayat of the Quran addressing the people he says that those alladheena zalamu anfusuhum those who have been unjust to themselves by committing sins they put themselves in a situation where Allah has a right to punish them so they are being unjust to themselves Allah says those who do this ja'uka o muhammad if they come to you fastaghfirullah and do istighfar to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's amazing they will do istighfar to allah but allah says if they come to you wastaghfir lahum ar-rasul and rasul also does istighfar and ask for forgiveness la wajadu allah tawwaban rahima they will find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be tawwab, you know, somebody who responds to their plea for forgiveness and rahim and the most merciful. I selected this ayat keeping in mind that we are going through the, the days of the azar of Sayyidah Shahada, especially we are now very close to the days of Arba'een. And one of the important issues is about the concept of ziyarat. And I would like to briefly talk about it, keeping in context that, you know, if you look at the situation around the world, this whole fitna of ISIS, basically if you look at the roots of that, it goes big back to this, you know, philosophy that anyone who does not agree with our philosophy is a kafir. He's a kafir or he's a mushrik. And as soon as you give that level to somebody who says the kalima and you say they are kafir and mushrik, those who are misinformed and ignorant among them, they go the step ahead. And they say it means I can kill them. And this is actually based on this uh, understanding which comes from the roots of Salafism and Wahhabism. You know, they basically look at anyone, for example, especially when they look at the issue of Ziyarat. And this is not only regarding the Shias. They have a problem with the Sunnis, with the Sufis, on the same issue. They say, when you go for the ziyarat of, of awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when, when you go and visit the shrines or the graves of those whom you consider to be, to be the Allah, the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is bid'at and this is shirk. And the problem that, you know, this is where we see that, you know, they go to the extent of wherever they come into power for a long time or for a short time, one of the first things they do, as if that is the top priority to solve the problems of the human society, is to demolish the shrines. As if by doing that, you know, everything will be okay. 
1925, they came into Medina. You know, you see what happened to uh, Jannat al-Baqi. If they had their way, even the shrine of Rasulullah would not, be, would not have been there. But, you know, they were afraid. They said, when you demolish Jannat al-Baqi, at the most, you know, some of these um, Sufi, Shi Sunnis, and the Shias will cry about it and protest. But if you touch the shrine and the grave of the Prophet, the entire Muslim world will turn against you. And they wanted to maintain this status of being the guardian of the holy places. And so they ideologically still believe that that grave of the Prophet is actually a hallmark of shirk and bid'at. But you know, this is where we see that they are the biggest of munafiq. If you really believe in that way, you should have gone, gone ahead and then we'll see what, you will have, what will happen to you. But they know, they know that, you know, you can, they cannot do this because the Muslim world will not tolerate that at all. And, and then when they move forward, this is where you see this emergence of the violent, you know, dimension of this philosophy in form of Taliban. And then now we see in form of Daesh or ISIS. And so it's important to understand when we talk about the ziyarat, especially Arba'een is an occasion where, you know, the ziyarat of Imam Hussain alayhi salam becomes a very important element of this aza of Sayyid al-Shahuda. Salawat from Iqbal. The problem is that they do not differentiate between what is ziyarat and what is ibadat. Ziyarat, this is an Arabic term, Zara Yazuru. You know, he visited or he is visiting. And so Ziyarat means visitation. You know, in, in Farsi and Urdu also we use it in, in a common way that, you know, so and so went to visit so and so. And so this is a very common term used in that way. When we go to the Ziyarat of Rasul, to the grave of Rasul or the Aimma, or the, you know, holy figures of Islam, we are not going there for ibadat, we are going there for ziyarat. And there is a big difference between ziyarat and ibadat. If you look at the whole concept of hajj, Muslims and millions go for ziyarat of Baytullah. But they're, they're, that's where I say that, you know, they have to actually realize you cannot judge people by the appearance of things. You have to understand what they are saying and what they are doing. You know, if you look at the Kaaba, this is the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In a symbolic sense, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need a space. He cannot be confined to anywhere. But he has chosen that. It is the matter of what we call nisbat. He says, I have linked this space to me. And therefore it becomes very sacred. It has a special hurmat in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we go, it, is, it, it has become a duty for us, if we have the health and the money, to go and do the ziyarat of Baytullah. Just think about a scenario. Although, you know, according to the laws, non-Muslim non is not allowed to go. But just think about it. Take a non-Muslim to Mecca. Outside Masjid al-Haram, put a blindfold on him. Take him to the second story of this building surrounding the Kaaba. And when people are doing their namaz, open the blindfold. This is a person who knows nothing about Islam. Ask him what is his observation. He will say they are worshipping this house. Because this is what he, he doesn't know anything about Islam. When he looks at the people going down on the ground in front of the house, they, they, he, because of his ignorance, he will make a judgment, which is a wrong judgment, that they are worshipping the Kaaba. But Muslims don't worship the Kaaba. They worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facing the direction of the Kaaba. There are two different things. This is very similar to, you know, we get this accusation about ourselves. You know, when we do the sajda, we do, we put our forehead on the turbat. Those some 
Muslims who are not, you know, familiar with the Shia ways of doing things and not the Shia laws and requirements, you know, they come out with this thinking and, you know, there are some uh, people who actually use this kind of uh, term and they say, look at the Shias, they are Turbat Parast. You know, they worship the Turbat or Mohar Parast. We are not Turbat Parast or Mohar Parast. Just as the Muslims do the ka Sajda in front of the Kaaba are not Kaaba Parast. Yes, sir. They worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facing the Kaaba. We worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by putting our forehead on the earth. And that is known as the Turbat or Mohar. If that is how you, you're going to judge people, then I will, you know, I can just reverse the, uh, the whole, you know, logic and say you are carpet parast. Because you, you basically are putting your forehead on the, on the carpet. And so it's a matter of understanding and this is the problem with the uh, Wahhabis when they look at these things, they immediately put this label of shirk. And after that, the ignorant ones would go further in order to say that it is now okay, uh, you know, to kill them because now the, these uh, reciters of the Kalima have become uh, Bid'ati and Mushrik. Salawat from the Iqbara. If you look at the Quran, and I don't even want to go to Hadith or history here, if you look at the Quran, what does the Quran say? Is it permissible for Muslims to go and visit the grave of a fellow Muslim? Let alone Rasulullah, he is up there. You know, just ordinary moment. What does the Quran say about it? There is an ayat in Surah Tawbah. Surah Tawbah is one of those surahs which was revealed towards the end of the life of the Prophet. Not the last one, but among the last surahs to be revealed. And so this is not a surah which came during the early days where maybe the laws were changed later on. No. These are some of the uh, final, you know, statements of Islamic teachings. And there it's very interesting that in Surah Tawbah, well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about munafiqeen. He gives a command to the Prophet which is very interesting. He says, وَلَا تُسَلِّعَ عَلَىٰ عَهَدٍ مِّنُهُمْ مَا تَعَبَدَىٰ O Muhammad, if a munafiq dies, you are not allowed to do the namaz e janaza, salatul janaza on him abada. Not at all. So if you know this person was munafiq who died, even though he recited the kalima, Rasulullah is being told, لا تصلي على أحد منهم مات أبدا. Never ever are you allowed to do salatul janaza on a munafiq. Not only that. وَلَا تَقُمْ عَلَىٰ قَبْرِهِ And do not even stand by his grave. So it's not even, you know, reciting janazah is forbidden. Even go to visit the grave is forbidden. But this is about munafiqeen. Our mujtahideen in usul, when they talk about ishtihad, they use two terminologies to understand the ayat and the ahadith of the masumin. They say when you look at a sentence, a jumla, there is a mantuq of the jumla and then there is a mafhum of the jumla. Let me explain what does it mean. Mantuq means the apparent meaning of the sentence. Mafhum means the implied meaning of the sentence. For example, you know, there is an ayat in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Hujarat, Ya ayuhu al-ladheena amanu in jaakum fasikum bina bain fatabayyanu. O you who believe, if a fasiq, a sinful person who is known to be a liar, comes to you bina bain with a news, fatabayyanu. Do not just accept his news about someone or some, some group, just at face value, فَتَبَيَّنُوا Go and investigate. 
Because if you just take the information given to you from an unreliable source and then you act on it, you will be committing harm by maybe putting down an image of someone um, or tarnishing the image of someone or even inflicting harm on them. Because you took the action based on that information from unreliable person, a fasiq. فَتَبَيِّنُوا Therefore you are required to do tabayyun, which, which means investigate. This is mantuq of the jumla. Our ulama use that when they talk about hadith. If a fasiq rawi comes to you and say, qala rasulullah. You know, our ulama say, we'll not take that hadith. That's why the, you have this issue of sahih and za'if. And when we say hadith is sahih or za'if, one of the main basis of zu'uf of a hadith is the status of the rawi. If the rawi is fasiq, we will not accept it, whatever he says. Unless it is, you know, supported by some other sources. You know, it's amazing that um, some of the Muslims... Ulama of Rijal and Hadith in the Muslim world. They write about people like Umar ibn Sa'd, commander-in-chief of the Yazidi forces in Karbala. He has narrated some Hadith. And so his name is discussed there in Ilm Rijal. And it's amazing. I don't know how people think about this. They say he is the one who was in charge of killing Imam Hussein. But he is trustworthy. And this is where we have the problem when you have a person with that character or background. We don't accept him to be siqa. And so this ayat is the mantuq of the jumla. What is the mafum of the jumla? You replace the word fasiq with adil or a mu'min. Even though uh, the ayah doesn't say anything, but the implied meaning is that if a reliable person gives you a news, you may accept it. And so this is where we say mantuq of the jumla and mafum of jumla. Let me, you know, give you one simple example before I go to this ayat about uh, munafiq. Suppose we have a special, you know, uh, session of question answers and we say 15 and under not allowed. Age-wise. So somebody comes to say, Malana, I'm 25 and you didn't mention me. Am I allowed to come or not? What would you say? The mantuq of the jumla says 15 and under not allowed. This is the apparent meaning of the sentence. What is the implied meaning? I don't have to say. It means anyone who is above 15 is allowed. So first is mantuq, the other is mafhum, the apparent meaning of a sentence and the implied meaning of the sentence. Now we come to this ayat. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تُسَلِّ مَاتَ When he talks about munafiq, he says, O Rasul, you are not allowed to do namaz janaza on a munafiq and you are not even allowed to stay on the grave, by the grave of a munafiq. To do what? To do dua. Now this is the mantuq of the jumla. Mantuq, this is the apparent meaning of the ayat of Quran. Now let us replace that munafiq with mu'min. What will be the mafhum of the jumla? The mafhum of the jumla of the ayat of Quran would be that if it is a mu'min, it's not only that you are allowed to do namaz janaza, it is actually wajib kifai. You have to do namaz janaza and you are allowed to go and stand by the grave of a mu'min to do the ziyarat and to recite the fatiha. Salawat from the Iqbal. And so the Quran is very clear about it. It is the munafiqeen whose grave you are not allowed to do the ziyarat and visit. It is not the mu'mineen. You are allowed to do that. That is the mafhum of the ayat of Quran. 
منطوق زباد دے منافق مفہوم زباد دے مؤمن and so we don't even have to go here and there Quran is very clear about it especially when you talk about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam you know for us he is the the best of the humanity his Sayyid al-Anbiya wal-Mursaleen so to go and visit his shrine his grave there can be absolutely no bid'at and shirk there we are not worshipping we are going there to seek blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way he says when you commit a sin you can do istighfar directly but if you go to Rasul and you ask him also to pray for you there is more chances that you will find Allah to be tawwab and rahim and this is where we realize the power of the person of Rasulullah is great for us whether he is alive or he is dead. Salawat <laughs> Pranadek If they want to follow the Sunnah of the Sahaba, we have that also. Why did the first and the second Khalifa have this desire to be buried besides the grave of Rasulullah? We don't want to go into whether it was right or wrong, that's, that's not a topic here. The point is that if the dead Rasul had no impact, and if that Rasul after death, his grave has no value, why this desire from the first and the second Khalifa that we would like to be buried beside Rasulullah? It means from their point of view that the grave had its own barakat and its own impact. That they wanted to be close to it. Many, many of these, you know, uh, Sahaba have actually gone for the ziyarat. If you look at even the Khulafa, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz was not able to go to Medina for a long, long time. And so he specially paid to a person that you go on my behalf and do the ziyarat on my niyabat. The ziyarat of Rasulullah. There is a very interesting conversation between Imam Malik, the founder of the uh, Maliki Madhab, and um, Mansur Dawaniqi, the one of the early uh, Khulafa of Banu Abbas. And remember Imam Malik was born and died in Medina. He was a res resident of Medina. It's very interesting how, you know, this conversation goes on where he says he was there in Masjid Nabi. Addressing Mansur, he says, Ya Amir, Amir al muminin this is the title they used to use for all the Khulafa. For us, no, this is only for Ali, not even from any other Imam. And so he says to Mansur Dawaniqi, La tarfa' sawtaka fi hadha al-masjid. When you are in Masjid al-Nabi, do not raise your voice. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has advised certain people in Surah Hujarat where he says, لا طرف وصواتكم فوق صوت النبي Do not raise your voices over the voice of Rasulullah. And then the ayat goes on. He says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has praised certain people. إن الذين يغذون أصواتهم عند رسول الله Those who lower their voices in the presence of Rasul. And then the, he says the ayat goes on in Surah Hujarat. Where Allah has condemned those who actually raise their voice when they talk to the Prophet. The name Surah Hujarat comes from this ayat. You know, these Bedouins from the desert, sometimes they would come, even if it was summertime in the afternoon, which was the time for Rasulullah to rest, they would come to the house of Rasulullah and from outside they would actually say, Ya Muhammad, ukhruj. Oh Muhammad, come out, we want to see you, we are come to see you. They had no courtesy to wait for him to come. Or even the way they used to address him, they would say, Ya Muhammad. Now Rasulullah himself was rahmatun lil alameen. He never said anything. 
but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala couldn't tolerate. This is where he sends this ayat. He says, why do you call him in this way? It is better for you to wait until he comes out and then go and see him. Don't disturb him. You know, don't insult him by calling him this way. And so this, this is where Imam Malik now is talking to Mansur Dawaniqi. He says, when you come into Masjid al-Nabi because Rasulullah is, is buried here, you still have to maintain the hurmat and respect of Rasulullah. This is decades, if not a century, after the wafat of Rasul. Why? Because he goes on to say, in hurmatuhu mayyitan ka hurmatihi hayyan. The hurmat and honor and respect of Rasulullah when he was alive and when he is dead is equally the same. Salawat for the Akbar. You know, even uh, Amir al Mu'mineen, we don't know much about the janazah of Rasulullah. Unfortunately, even our people don't know much about it. Many of our people think there was a namaz janaza in a big way for Rasulullah. Some people came, some didn't come. You had to realize the ghusl and the kafan and the burial was done under the supervision of Amir al-Mu'mineen. This was not done by anyone because they were the part of the family. And Rasulullah was buried in the same room that he died. And the janazah was not done in a jamaat form. The room was not big enough. His body was not brought to, uh, to the masjid outside. Amir al muminin would allow three to five people, based on the size of the room, to go inside and to recite the janazah furada individually. Why? Because Ali used to say, Rasulullah is our Imam Hayyan wa Mayyitan. Rasulullah is our Imam, whether he's alive or he's dead, doesn't matter. So even when his body is there, you will not have a Jamaat prayer. And this is where we have to realize that the importance of Rasulullah from our point of view is very great. And this is where the whole process took a long time. Because three to five people will go in, do their janazah, come out, others will go. And so there was kind of a lineup, which went more than 24 hours. And so when we talk about this issue, we also see this even in the event of the shahadat of Imam Hassan al-Mushtaba alayhi salatu wa salam. When there was an attempt, to take the body of Imam Hassan, either to bury by uh, close to Rasulullah, or at least for go through the tawaf of the uh, Qabr of Rasul before he be buried in Jannat al-Baqi, and the whole opposition by Ali Marwan and Aisha was there. There Imam Hussain alayhi salam uttered these words from the Quran. When they were shouting and saying, we'll not allow this. He uses the same ayat, he says, Quran says, لا ترفع أصواتكم فوق صوت النبي. Do not raise your voices in the presence of Rasulullah. Even though he's dead, this is his grave. You still have to maintain that respect. And let me just extend that to us. This ayat from Surah Hujarat which says, do not raise your voice over the voice of Rasulullah. Is this an ayat which died with him? And applies only to those who were in the presence of Rasulullah. No, it applies even now to us. If you come to know with absolute you know, assurance given to you by the scholarship that this hadith or this hukum of sharia is from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then you say, well, you know, but I don't believe it. Even to utter that word, that sentence, yeah, it might be Rasul, from Rasulullah and it might be his hukum, but 
I don't agree with it. Even to make that statement is actually equivalent to the statement of vo raising our voice against the voice of Rasulullah. Whatever he said those days, if it is confirmed to be his, his command and his teaching, and today I come and challenge that, I'm actually, you know, raising my voice over the voice of Rasulullah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not take this lightly. Because the ayat goes on at the end. It says, you do not realize when you do this, all your good deeds can become null and void. وَعَنْتُمْ لَا تَشْعَرُونَ In such a way that you wouldn't even realize what, what is happening to you. So we have to realize when we talk about the hurmat of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whether he was alive or after his death, for us it is the same. And this is where, you know, um, I'm reminded of this uh, a narration somebody sent me in, in email. I'm not sure, it's, it's not a hadith, no, it's a story uh, from uh, Medina of the present day. Whether it's really happened or it's just a story, but the argument was very interesting. You know, some of these, um, I'm of Masajid in Masjid al Nabi. You know, it's not one person, there is one person who is the lead. Uh, you know, Pesh Namaz or Imam of Masjid and Nabi, but there are many others also with him. And they normally have this habit that once they have done Namaz al Jamaat, they sit down and talk to the Zahirin who had come for the Ziyarat of Rasulullah. And they always, you know, bring this whole issue that, you know, there's no need to do Ziyarat. You know, he's gone and dead, and this is, you know, he doesn't listen to what you're saying, and there's no benefit. Just talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this shaykh, just to demonstrate that, took out his pen. And he basically looked towards one of the travelers there. And he says, oh fellow, khudha, take this. So he started to get up. So he said, okay, sit down. I told you to take it and you started to get up. You responded to what I was saying. Then he says, let's try now. Then he turned towards the grave of Rasulullah. And he says, Ya Muhammad Khuza. He repeated it two, three times. He so, didn't hear anything. And now he's saying to his audience, see, this person is alive. Therefore, he reacted. Then he responded. And Muhammad is dead. There is no benefit in asking him. There was a fellow from Africa who stood up, went to the Sheikh. He said, Oh Sheikh, can I borrow your pen? So he gave it to him. He didn't know what he was getting, getting into. And this fellow this, took the pen, looked up, and he says, Ya Allah, khuzha. <laughs> he tried two, three times, no answer came. He says, according to your logic, Allah is also dead. This is where the Shaykh took his qalam and just went out of the masjid. Salawat <laughs> Pratnikmat. See, the issue is not that we don't get the response. The response is there. If you read the words of the ziyarat, from our ninth Imam regarding, I think it's first Rajab or 15th of Rajab, Ziyarat for Imam Hussain alayhi salam, there is, there is a statement where we say, Oh Imam, we know you listen to our Ziyarat and Salam. And we believe that you respond to it, even though we do not hear that. The problem is not there, the problem is here. For us, it's very easy to understand that. Everybody almost, you know, here has the cell phone. But when somebody calls you on your cell phone, the mobile phones of others doesn't ring. It only rings yours. Why? Because, you know, that number is linked to your cell phone. 
So the wavelengths are coming are going only there. The issue is, are you connected? The issue is, are you in an area where the wavelength from the Imam are reaching you? Or are you in an area where the reception is not good? Maybe the barriers of guna is there. So it's not that the response is not coming from there. The response is coming. We have to get rid of the veils and the hijabat and the barriers between us and our Imam. Salawat Prana Iqbara. There was a, a person um, in Iran, a prominent alim, and this is a narration that I've heard from the writings actually I read from one of my teachers in Qom, who is still alive, may Allah keep him long and give him a long life. He talks about a prominent alim, he said he'd gone for ziyarat to Karbala. In those days, you know, when people used to go, it was not like the American style, we go in a week and come back. <laughs> you don't travel by plane those days. And so, you know, people take a uh, you know, long time, they go and stay there for half a month or a month or more. So he says, I was there one day and I saw a dream. And in the dream, I saw that there was a young man who is going into the haram of Imam Hussain alayhi salam. A very simple man. And when he does the salam to the zari of Imam Hussain alayhi salam, he gets the answer, alayka salam ahsant. Means, alayka salam, well done. Now this alim was surprised, you know, what is the meaning of this dream? And on that day, then he goes for the ziyarat. To his amazement, you know, he saw in the haram, the same young person that he saw in the dream is coming in. He followed him. And then later on, he, you know, called him on the side and he said, I want to know from you, is this true, what I saw in the dream? And he says, yes. He says, what did you do? Because I am a, you know, Apparently, I'm a pious person, I'm an alim, and you know, I don't hear this. What have you done that you hear this? He says, this started one day. I have an old father who can no more walk. And I have a habit that once a week, I always come from my place, whether it was a village in the suburb or somewhere, I come for the ziyarat. Then my father was insisting that one day take me. In those days we didn't have wheelchairs. He says, I basically put him on my back. Carried him all the way to, you know, the city of Karbala and brought him for ziyarat. He says, from that day, whenever I go for the ziyarat, I get this response. Alayka salam ahsant. A simple service to the father or a mother can give you that ability to hear the response from the Imam when you, when you go for the ziyarat. Salawat <laughs> And so do not ever consider this issue of the Rasul and the Aima that when, when we go for ziyarat this is shirk or bid'at. No. You know, if we can explain to these people who are ignorant. You know, Imam Malik in his conversation with uh, Mansur Dawaniqi, the, the Khalifa, it goes on, he says, you know, the Khalifa now turn to him, turns to him, he says, when I'm doing the ziyarat of Rasul, apparently he was looking at the ziyarat from the side and the Qibla is this way, the Zari is there, so he's facing this way. He says, when I do the dua, do I face the Qibla or do I face the grave of the Prophet? And this is where Imam Malik says, Lima tasrifu wajhaka anhu. Why would you turn your face away from the grave of Rasulullah? Wa huwa wasilatuka wa wasilatu abika Adam. While he is your intercessor and the intercessor of your father Adam. Till the day of Qiyamah, he is your 
uh, wasila. You know, face the grave and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he quoted the same ayat from Surah An-Nisa that I recited earlier in the khutbah. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that those who commit sins, if they come to you, O Muhammad, and they do istighfar themselves, and they ask you to do istighfar, they, they will find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be tawwab and rahim. Salawat from the Iqbal. Ziyarat basically has three, you know, purposes. Number one, and I'll leave the details inshallah for tomorrow night. I just picked on this theme because it is Thursday night. Normally we recite Ziyarat Warisa. But I don't think I have the time to go to the wordings of that and some of the important messages. So we'll leave that for tomorrow. But let me just summarize here. Three things happen when we recite, especially when we talk about Ziyarat Warisa. Number one, and other Ziyarat that we have from the Imams. Our Aqeedah become correct. If we have any ambiguity on issues, confusion about certain issues, especially when it comes to the status of Rasulullah and the Aima of Ahlul Bayt, the text of the Ziyarat is a very important way of correcting our own belief system. Number two, if you really look at it, it can have an impact on your um, you know, character, reforming yourself. And finally, the ziyarat basically are the, the ways by which you know, we actually renew our bayat to the Ahlul Bayt. You know, just think about it. Why do the enemies attack the shrines of the Imams? What is in it? <coughs> what was the power of the grave of Imam Hussain during the days of Mutawakkil? What was happening? People were just going for ziyarat. But even that simple ziyarat of the grave of Imam Hussain became a threat for people like Mutawakkil. Where he tried to, you know, erase the sign of the grave of Imam Hussain Why? Because the enemy knows that one of the ways by which this community is maintaining its faith is through this process of ziyarat. Mutawakkil aya aur chala gaya. Uska naam aur nishan kahi nahi hai. Lekin Hussain ka gumbad abhi bhi hai. इस जमाने में भी आप देख लें सद्दाम के पास मिडिल ईस्ट की लार्जेस्ट अरब आर्मी थी तेल की दौलत उसके पास है सबसे बड़ी फौज अरब मुल्क की उसके पास है लेकिन ये शख्स जो है ज्यारत अरबईन से घबराता था बहुत कोशिश की इसने के जो 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 ट्रेडिशन है इराकियों में शियों में कि वो वॉक करके जाते हैं ये इसलिए नहीं है कि ये गरीब हैं डोंट एवर थिंक दैट वे ये लोग जो वॉक करके जाते हैं बसरा कहाँ है देखा है ना एट द माउथ ऑफ द पर्शियन गल्फ साउथ में बिल्कुल और करबला कहाँ है नजफ फिर भी करीब है मसलन सामर्रा से काजिमैन से बगदाद से दूसरे इलाकों से ये सदियों से इराक के शियों का रिवाज था और है कि वो वॉक करके जाते हैं इसलिए नहीं कि उनके पास पैसे नहीं थे सवारी का सामान नहीं था नहीं अकीदत थी लेकिन सद्दाम जिसके पास दौलत भी है फौज भी है हुकूमत भी है ताकत भी है सब कुछ है वो डरता है उन निहत्ते मुजाहरीन इमाम हुसैन से इसी से आप अंदाजा लगाइए कि कितनी ताकत है इस जियारत में अभी भी जो आप सिलसिला देख रहे हैं स्पेशली लास्ट ईयर वो बात यही थी ताकि दुश्मन को आइसिस को एहसास हो कि ये एक जिंदा कौम है मुर्दा नहीं है तो चाहे मुतवकिल पुराने जमाने का हो या सद्दाम इस जमाने का हो ये आएंगे जाएंगे ये गुम्बत को तबाह करेंगे 
ان کا نشان ختم ہو جائے گا ہمارے آئمہ کے مراقب دوبارہ زندہ ہو جائیں گے کبھی بھی یہ ختم نہیں ہو سکتے سامرہ میں انہوں نے کوشش کی پھر بھی ابھی دیکھیں آپ اور یہ در حقیقت خدا وند عالم کا وعدہ ہے حسین کے ساتھ امام حسین علیہ السلام نے سب کچھ قربان کر دیا اور جس طرح سے قربانی پیش کی ہے اس کا یہ صلاح ہے کہ لوگوں کے دل میں وہ احساس ہے وہ حرارت ہے حسین کی محبت کی جو کبھی بھی ختم ہونے والے نہیں ہے لا تبرد عبدہ اور یہ در حقیقت ایک صلاح ہے جو خدا نے حسین کو دیا ہے اس دنیا میں بس ایک منظر پر ہم ختم کرنا چاہیں گے کہ ایام یہ ایام اہل حرم کے ہیں امام حسین نے سب کچھ قربان کر دیا اپنے اصحاب کی قربانی دی ہے اپنے گھر والوں کی قربانی دی ہے اپنے اولاد کی قربانی دی ہے اپنی قربانی دی ہے لیکن ازاداران حسین شہادت پہلے بھی ہوئی ہیں شہادتیں بعد میں بھی ہوئی ہیں لیکن حسین کی شہادت کا عنوان کچھ اور تھا جو سب سے بڑی مظلومیت ہے وہ امام حسین علیہ السلام کے لاش کی بے حرمتی جو ہوئی کسی شہید کے لاش کو پامال نہیں کیا گیا ہے نہ رسول کے زمانے میں نہ امیر المومنین کے ساتھ نہ حسم مشتبہ کے ساتھ نہ کسی اور امام کے ساتھ لیکن یہ صرف حسین ہے اور زینب اس منظر کو دیکھتی رہی ہے بس ایک جملہ کہتی ہیں آسمان کی طرف دیکھ پر کہ نانا جان آسمان کے ملائک آپ پر سلوات پڑھتے ہیں آپ کا وہ مقام ہے آپ کی وہ عظمت ہے لیکن زمین پر آ کے دیکھیں آپ کی حرمت کا خیال نہیں رکھا گیا حسین کی حرمت کا خیال نہیں رکھا گیا اور گھوڑوں کو اس طرح گھوڑوں نے اس طرح سے اس لاش کو پامال کیا ہے کہ چھٹے امام کی روایت ہے کہ میرے جد کے سینے کی ہڈیاں جا کے پشت کے ہڈیوں سے مل جاتی ہے عزداران حسین یہ جو سوال اکثر ہوتا ہے کہ سکینہ نے بابا کے لاشوں کو لاشے کو سر بغیر کس طرح سے پہچانا ہے اس کی ایک علامت یہ تھی اس لیے کہ کسی شہید کا لاشہ اس طرح سے پامال نہیں ہوا تھا جس طرح سے حسین کا لاشہ پامال ہوا تھا اور اس لیے یہ جب قافلہ چلا ہے اور امام زین العابدین جب وہاں سے روانہ ہوئے ہیں جو کیفیت تھی وہ عجیب و غریب تھی کہ جناب زینب بھائی کے لاش پر رو رہی تھی روتے روتے ایک مرتبہ جب چہرے عابد بیمار پر نظر جاتی ہے اپنے غم کو روک کر صبر کر لیتی ہے کہتی ہیں بیٹا تمہاری یہ کیا کیفیت ہے اس وقت امام سجاد نے کہا فکی جان ہم زندہ اور جوان ہیں لیکن بابا کا لاشہ بے گور و کفن کربلا میں چھوڑ کے جا رہے ہیں اس وقت زینب نے تسلی کے لیے یہی کہا تھا کہ بیٹا تمہارے دادا نے مجھ سے کہا ہے ایک وقت آئے گا یہاں روزہ بھی بنے گا اور بڑی تعداد میں شیعہ جو ہے تیرے بابا کی زیارت کے لیے آئے قبول فرما ہمارے گناہ کو بخش دے ہمارے توفیقات میں اضافہ فرما خدا وندہ شیعان علی جہاں ہیں ان کو اپنے حفظ امان میں رکھ خدا وندہ تکفیری افواج کے تمام صلاحیت کو نیست و نابود فرما امام کے ظہور میں تاجل فرما ربنا تقبل منہ نکنت السمیون علیہ